The scripture this morning is from Galatians 5, verses uh, 13 through 16 and 22 through 25. The life of the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Words. They're lovely words 
But we all know how hard it is to really make our lives follow that list. As I was telling Elliot and the others up here, it's really hard to put love first and all you do. It doesn't seem like it would be. It seems like it would come naturally, but for some reason, it doesn't always. We tend to be pulled toward the negative list. And maybe the thought of actually living into the fruit of the Spirit seems a little more mission impossible than possible. But it might please you to know, I know this pleases me to know, that our founding father of Methodism sees it as quite possible. John Wesley delivered a famous sermon called, called On Zeal. And there's a graphic that goes with that that I had to put in bulletin. Okay. Um, in this sermon on zeal, John Wesley describes how the whole practice of Christian discipleship leading to sanctification works. You know, he thought that we were on this journey toward Christian perfection, and we started out by just being saved by grace, and then we were justified when we realized that that grace was active in our lives, and then the whole rest of our life journey was about trying to reach some sort of sanctification of that grace. And so, in this sermon, he kind of describes that process for us. He says that at the center is love, which you see in the center of the circle. The center radiates out to what he calls holy tempers, but it's basically things like you read in that list of the fruit of the Spirit. Holy tempers are like patience and goodness and kindness. So we practice love in works of mercy to others, John Wesley says. That's anything that you would put under the category of love your neighbor. You know, serving at the homeless shelter, or being an acolyte at church, or um, preparing food for someone when they're ill. Anything that you put in the category of mercy works, love of neighbor, is that second category, works of mercy. And then nurturing your own love with works of piety. And John Wesley would call that things like hearing and reading the word, or public and private prayer, communion. Fasting. And then the outermost circle is the church universal, which John Wesley believed in us coming together and gathering to praise and worship God, that that act itself provokes us to love. John Wesley suggests that if we don't continuously work on everything in that circle, we succumb to what he calls the passions of the flesh, those words we left out of reading, hatred and bitterness and pride, anger, persecution, anything basically that is not joined with and directed by love. This sermon by Wesley reminds us that at the core of our denominational faith, at least in the eyes of this accidental founder, is love. Now we may see signs in our own denomination and other denominations of succumbing to the other list, hatred, bigotry, persecution, but that's not who we are or what we were founded on. Sometimes the scripture is misinterpreted in anything that is of the flesh is bad. And so we have to somehow get outside of our flesh and somehow be otherworldly in our works of piety and goodness. And something that Wesley thought that way too, which is why he was so obsessed with his, his methodical practice of spiritual. But I don't read it that way. I think Paul is saying to the Galatians in this letter that we have to recognize that all we're ever called to be is in our own flesh. And so we should live into that flesh of who we are, not for the purpose of harming someone or taking advantage of someone, but so that we can take the love that the Holy Spirit infuses in our flesh into a broken world. Paul believed that because we too are broken, we pour ourselves out into a broken world in need as some sort of redemption. And that's actually what Jesus is in the Last Supper, too, in his breaking of the bread and sharing the cup, my body broken, my blood poured out. And John Wesley's fixation on the disciplines, spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, communion, was not to avoid being in the flesh, but to practice over and over in his fleshly body what it means to love. I read a commentary this week that said, 
we become what we love. And our loves can be directed either toward God and neighbor or toward our own selfish feelings. Lately, the news has been frightening and discouraging. It seems every day there's more fear and distrust of one human being to the next. Orlando, the recent vote in the United Kingdom, something every week to make us worry or wonder or fret. I heard an interview on Terry Gross's Fresh Air on NPR this week with someone who's done a lot of research into the last 30 years' rise of concealed carry gun ownership in the U.S. I'm not getting into a gun ownership debate here. But he said that we've only recently become a country that sees gun ownership as a form of security. That even the NRA hasn't always believed in single carry gun ownership for its citizens. It seems that the more distrust we have for one another, the more we feel we have to stand up for our own, and the more fear itself grows in our world. What if we could move past our anxiety, our fears? What if we could move past our rage? What if we could truly embrace the message of Christ, the message Christ is and has always been? Christ himself came as a message for us. Christ came down to be a message of love for us. Christ wore human flesh to be a message for us. It's Jesus, after all, who tells us the story of the Good Samaritan, the man who was feared and hated because he was different from everyone else. He was of a different tribe. And this feared and hated man was the only one who stopped to help someone meet and battered on the side of the road. That's the story Jesus told us. It was Jesus, after all, that told us that we should reach out to everyone through his actions. Because Jesus is the one who reaches out to the woman at the well that everybody else shuns. It's Jesus, after all, who touches the lepers and heals them when everyone else just wants them out of the backyard. Nowhere in the narrative of Jesus do you read of him being afraid or living in fear of the other. You read exactly the opposite of that. If we call ourselves Christians, and most of us here say we do, then we've got to start living fully and completely into the message of Jesus. We have to hang our shingle of love outside of the door of this place and on the doors of our own homes and our neighborhood and let everyone know that as for us and our house, we serve the Lord, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, and God is Love first, love at the center, love at the heart. This leads to all the other fruit of the Spirit. And ultimately, as Paul suggests in this letter, to a certain group of people that applies to all, this love at the center, love first, love at the heart, will lead to freedom. And at least for me, freedom is the opposite of fear. Freedom is love. Anything that is not wrapped in love is binding us in fear instead of freedom. And love is the only key with which we can unlock the chains that bind our hearts. Renowned theologian Henry Nowen puts it this way. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are real questions. I must trust that the little bit of love that I sow now will bear many fruits here in this world and in the life to come. I'm not generally a single issue thinker. I think it's important to see connections everywhere to everything, good and bad and in between. I like to make connections out in the real world to what we believe and see in our faith. I think, though, that to survive in this current climate of fear and polarization and unrest, and to 
to make the mission of serving Christ possible, I might need to become a single issue leader for a while, to concentrate fully and singularly on love. How about you? Love of self, love of neighbor, love of other, love of the whole world. Lynn Manuel Miranda was the winner of the Tommy this year for writing the best musical, Hamilton. And he says this best in his acceptance speech, which was just after the Dora No shooting. We live through times when hate and fear seem stronger. We rise and fall and light from dying embers. Remembrances that hope and love last longer. And love is 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 love. Is love, is love. Cannot be killed or swept aside. You are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses. But serve each other through love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, thankfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. And love is love is love.